Hi, I'm Miranda Wright, and this is day 10 of our 120-day Upper Room Prayer Campaign. Today we're going to begin to identify and pray against specific principalities laid out in Scripture. We're going to search the Scripture for their identifying characteristics and tactics so that we can pray strategic prayers and gain a greater discernment against the wiles of the devil from our basis of discernment, which is the Word of God. The focus of today's prayer mandate is against the principality Leviathan. Several months back, before the Lord positioned me and connected us all for prayer, I had a dream that I was fighting Leviathan and that I killed him with a sword. Now, we understand scripturally that principalities cannot be killed or destroyed, but they can be disposed. And I believe the dream was representative of a defeat against this particular principality. And so we're going to begin our prayers against specific principalities here. Now, it's interesting that Leviathan is destroyed by the sword, and I'll lay that out for you in Scripture in a minute. But we have to understand that the sword is the word, and it is the very thing that destroys Leviathan in the end. Because while we can cast spirits, powers, and principalities out of our territory, in the end, the Lord himself will destroy Leviathan according to Scripture, and he will do it with the sword. In Ephesians 6, when we talk about the full armor of God, We look at all of the aspects of the armor and realize that they're all defensive. They give us the ability to stand and withstand the attacks of the enemy. There's only one weapon that has a defensive and offensive aspect to it, and that is the sword. The sword can be used to defend and reflect, but it can also be used to attack. And there's something very interesting. When the Bible says in Ephesians to arm yourself with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God... We have to understand that the Greek language in which the New Testament was originally written was very much more descriptive than our common English language. So many words that we have one word for in English had many words for in the Greek that described different aspects or characteristics of that word. And the word word is one of those. There were two separate words for word. One was logos and one was rhema. Logos means the written word of God, like our scripture, and rhema means the present tense spoken word of the Lord, which comes by unction of the Holy Spirit. When we get into that place of prayer where we allow ourselves to be used of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks that word through us, and it's no longer our words, but it is the decrees of heaven being spoken through our mouths as a vessel of heaven, then that becomes rhema. God can speak to us personally and that's rhema. He can use the logos, the word of God, to open up and say that thing that we really needed to hear right in that moment. And then it becomes rhema because it is a living word. But it's interesting that it's called the sword of the spirit and that it is the word of God. But it says it is the rhema word of God specifically. Therefore, when we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us with the powers and decrees of heaven, that proclamation is rhema and it is a sword that comes out of our mouth and attacks the enemy. It has power in it and it is our only attacking weapon that is granted in the armor of God. That's why Jesus said that he said that if you will have faith, one, if you will pray and fast and if you will speak to the mountain it shall be cast into the sea because the sword of the word of the Lord must come forth out of the mouth of a person who is yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit so there is great power in prayer in proclamation in decree in in the prophet in letting the spirit of the living God come forth and go out into the land and do the works of heaven We read in Isaiah 27 verse 1, In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. God is going to destroy Leviathan and the weapon that destroys him is the sword. And so we see that the sword is our source of attack. It is the thing by which God destroys the enemy through us, which is why the devil fights so hard to silence the saint. But God says we will overcome him by the blood of the lamb, which allows the Holy Spirit to indwell us so that his word can come out of us. And by the word of our testimony and because we love not our lives unto the death, because when you speak that thing out, it is a sword that is going forth to destroy the lies of the enemy. 
So if Rhema is our offense, our attack, then I would say that Logos is our defense, our discernment. Because it says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and it is able to divide even between the spirit and the soul. And it is a discerner of the hearts and intents of men. The word of God is our discernment, which is our defense. It's the place by which we learn the tactics of the enemy so that we are not deceived by the enemy who is a great counterfeiter. And we're going to talk about that more as we talk about Leviathan because he is known for twisting the truth. He's identified as the twisted serpent. He is that forked tongue twisted serpent that is very cunning and good at twisting the truth. He's not one that's likely to come and bald face lie to you. He's more likely to try to sell you a half lie because he knows he can get you to swallow it. He's not the one that's going to tell you there is no such thing as a prophet. He's the one that's going to bring you the false prophet. He's going to twist the truth. He's going to pervert the truth. He's going to counterfeit what is of God. Leviathan is a name that we all recognize, but maybe one that we don't really understand because though he's mentioned quite a bit throughout scripture, his descriptions are somewhat vague. But as we look through the things that are said about him in scripture, we can begin to gather a picture of the power of this principality and how he works. The Bible says that he is untamable. He is rebellious. In Job 41, 34, it says, He beholdeth all high things. He is the king over all the children of pride. And so this tells us a lot. Because if he is the ruler of pride, then he is the principality of pride itself. The Bible says that God gives more grace unto the humble, but he resisteth the proud. Grace is God's favor, his power, and his divine influence. If you want to increase in favor with God, if you want to increase with in power with God and if you want to have more of his divine influence to lead God direct and correct you then you need to walk in more humility because those who are led by a prideful spirit are led by the spirit of Leviathan and God will resist you to be prideful is actually the opposite of being righteous because pride is having faith in what you think is right But to be righteous is to have faith in what God says is right. So anytime we come to a place in the word of God where we see something and it may pierce our heart and it may crucify our flesh and it may be uncomfortable. But if we choose to say that's not right or I don't agree with that or I want it to be this or that doesn't apply to me, then you are being influenced by a spirit of Leviathan. It is pride. Righteousness literally means to be in right standing. In other words, to come into alignment with what God says is right. And the Bible says only the righteous shall enter the kingdom of God, but the prideful shall be cast into a pit. It says that hell opens her mouth wide for the prideful, the mean man, the pomp man. And he shall be humbled in the end when every knee bows and every eye sees and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. And his word is right and his way is right because he is right. It is his righteousness that we take on when what he says is right becomes what we say is right. Pride is boastful. Pride is blasphemous. Pride hates. Pride takes offense. Pride slanders. Pride attacks. Pride lies. Pride makes its own way. Pride trusts in self more than it trusts in God. Pride enjoys flattery. Pride enjoys position and pomp. Pride enjoys pleasure and wants to please the flesh. Pride wants to be worshipped. Pride wants to be like God. In fact, pride is the opposite of God. Because God is selfless love and humility. God came to be born as a man and he could have been born into a palace he could have been born anywhere into anything and he chose to be born in a barn like an animal like a baby lamb he came because he came to be the sacrificial lamb to take away the sin of the world but he came to demonstrate humility and everything that he did through his life was a demonstration of absolute selfless humility And all those who rose against him were incited by a spirit of pride. The scriptures say that the Pharisees crucified Christ for envy. They envied him because of their pride. 
They did not like that the power of God was moving more through this no-named nobody than it was through them in their big churches and their high seats. And so through pride, they turned against him and sought to kill him. Therefore, Leviathan works very often from a place of religious establishment. Is religion bad? No, of course not. In fact, the Bible says to love and care for the widow and the orphan is perfect, pure, and undefiled religion. Religion in itself is not bad, but but the spirit of Leviathan gets in there and counterfeits the real thing and makes it about a person, makes it about you when it should be about serving God and serving others. The Bible says that God is love, and this is another one of those words that we have to take back to the Greek because in the Greek there were several different words for the one word that we call love. There was a specific kind of love that was related to God, and it was called agape. And this love was a true love, a selfless, self-sacrificing love, because true love is sacrifice. We will sacrifice for those we love, and true love always puts the other person first. There are other kinds of love. For example, a selfish love, a sensual love, was known as eros. Eros was also the name of a pagan god. It's where we get the word erotic from. It's a lustful love. It's a counterfeit of real love love because real love agape love God's love is selfless but eros is selfish it's self-concerned in first Corinthians 13 we have that classic passage though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity I have become as sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal we see that word charity there but when we take it back to the Greek we see something interesting the word that was there originally was agape It's the same word that is used whenever God says, I am love, I am agape. So when you read these things, you can replace that word charity with love or with God, because these are literally the characteristics. God is a spirit and those that come to worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But he literally is the spirit of love. And so God, but not just any love, he is the, he is the spirit of selfless, self-sacrificing love. And so when we look at these, we can say, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love or have not God, then I am nothing. And this brings us to an interesting point because it continues on. He says, though I have the gift of prophecy, but I do not have agape, which is God and love. I don't have anything. In other words, if, but not just any love selflessness if I am not selfless sacrificial am I if I am not full of the spirit and the heart of God himself even though I do all of these things it says speak with tongues have gifts have prophecy have great knowledge of the word have faith to do miracles do good deeds and feed the poor make myself a martyr if I have all of these things but do not have God then I am nothing, which brings to question, how can you do all these things without God? Because there's a counterfeit. There's Leviathan. Because Jesus said that many, in fact, the same many that are on the broad way to hell, he said, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied and done many wonderful works in your name? And he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. In other words, there is a people who will be deceived Because they're looking for gifts to be the evidence that they have the Holy Spirit. When Jesus never said that gifts will be the evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. He said you will know them by their fruit. By their character. Do they have the character of God? Because the Antichrist spirit works in signs and lying wonders. The devil can counterfeit gifts. Leviathan is the one who does it. The devil can counterfeit gifts, but the only thing the devil cannot counterfeit is a holy life. So if you're following after signs and wonders, you will be deceived. But if you're following after righteousness, like God told us to do, you will not be deceived. The Bible describes Leviathan as a twisting serpent. And this brings to surface the imagery of of that old serpent in the garden, that forked tongue serpent, that liar, that deceiver, that one who twists the truth. 
Because we have to ask ourselves, how did those people that stood before Christ and, and Jesus says the many, this God, this has to be a wake up call to us people, because it literally says that narrow is the way that leadeth to life and few are they that find it. So if we truly believe the words of Jesus Christ, who said that nothing that came out of his mouth was not from God himself, then we have to come to terms with the reality that most people who think they're saved and serving God and are on the narrow path really are not. Because it says that very few actually found it. And the same many that were on the Broadway to hell were the same many that stood before him and said, we thought we were serving you. Because we were prophesying and doing all these great works in your name. And he's saying, but you were still working iniquity. I never knew you. You were never mine. You were working by a different spirit. You didn't bear my fruit. You didn't have my character. You didn't have my heart. You didn't have my love. You didn't have my humility. You didn't have my selflessness. You didn't have my concern for the lost. In fact, Jesus makes it very clear when he says that on the final day, it will be like a separating of the goats from the sheep. And the goats will go into everlasting destruction and the sheep will come into his barn. And he says the thing that makes them different, the thing that separates them is did you tend to the sick? Did you feed the homeless? Did you visit the imprisoned? Did you do the work of the kingdom? Did you have the heart of God for the least of these? Were you more concerned about serving than being served? Were you more concerned about hearing the truth than being flattered? Were you willing to sacrifice and be sanctified? Were you willing to be set apart? Were you willing to give up your plans and your will to take up his cross? Were you willing to lay down your pride? Were you willing to give up your offense and your hatred and your bitterness and love your neighbor more than yourself, even as Christ loved you, which means willing to give your very life for them? Selfless, sacrificial love. The Bible describes Leviathan as a monster from the sea. In Psalm 74, 14, it says, Thou breakest the heads of of Leviathan in pieces and givest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the fountains and the flood and driest up mighty rivers. God is powerful. God is almighty. God is able to bring floods and he is able to dry up the mightiest of rivers. But a greater work than even that, he is able to break the head of Leviathan into pieces. But I want you to notice something. In this particular passage, it says the heads multiple of Leviathan. So the spiritual imagery of this principality that he is bringing forth here is of a monster from the sea with many heads. We do see this imagery again in the Bible. In the book of Revelations in chapter 13, we see a beast rising out of the sea that has seven heads. And upon the heads, the name of blasphemy is written. Now, though this creature is not specifically identified and named as Leviathan, when we read through the description of it, it does fall into place because it describes him as being very prideful and boastful as having the mouth of a lion, which is very much the way he is described in the book of Job. Now, the interesting thing is that in the book of Revelations, it it represents a person and the power behind a person. It actually represents a system, a system of government also. So Leviathan can work through governments. He works through church leadership. He can work through any form of organized structure to gain control over a people. But very specifically, he represents a person whose power does not come from God. It is made very clear that though this seven-headed beast from the sea is able to do miracles, his power comes from Satan and not from God. It says that he's given power by the dragon and he deceives a great many people. It actually represents the Antichrist himself. And therefore, we have to tie Leviathan to the spirit of the Antichrist. Paul said, though there is a man, the Antichrist, coming in the end times, already now, even in Paul's time, he said, does the spirit of Antichrist work? And in this passage, this beast from the sea is the representation of the person and persons or governmental structure that allows the spirit of Antichrist to work through them. And it says something very interesting in this passage. It says that those who honor the person that this beast represents by proxy of honoring the person is literally worshiping the dragon because it's the dragon that his power is coming forth from. This is why it's so important to know the word of God so that we can have a basis of discernment so that we do not come into agreement 
with people that are working through wrong spirits because when we do, we give honor to the spirit that is working through them, which is the devil, which then brings us out of right standing with God, stripping us of our spiritual authority. And the devil says, checkmate. It also strips you of your protection and your blessing and makes you susceptible to a curse and to judgment. We see this principle laid out very clearly in the story of Balaam, but we'll go more in depth into that when we identify the characteristics of the spirit of Balaam another day. That spirit of Leviathan, which we can pair up with the spirit of Antichrist, it is the power of pride and it wants to be worshipped. Those that operate through this spirit or the structures that they create are very intimidating. According to the scripture, this spirit brings a sense of intimidation. People become scared to stir it up. But it always wars against the real saints of God. Those who know the word and are walking in alignment with God's will, it will come against them. We talked earlier about false prophets. You see through scripture that even though the true prophets were much less common than the false prophets, the false prophets and those operating under this influence of these spirits always came against the true prophets of God. In fact, Jesus himself said to rejoice and be glad whenever people persecute you and revile you and come against you and even try to kill you because so did they the same to all the prophets that came before you. In other words, you're in good company. It's probably showing that you're a real prophet when they come against you. In fact, God rebuked the Israelites for telling the prophets and saying to the prophets, prophesy unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit. They were wanting the false prophets. They wanted things that fluffed their flesh. They wanted things that edified their flesh. When in reality, true prophecy was always to bring correction and direction and get you back on the path of righteousness. Now, let me make something very clear here. I believe in prophecy. God uses me in that area when he sees fit. I believe in the prophets. I'm not against prophets. I'm against false prophets. I'm against those who make people comfortable in their sin. Who make them think they're on the narrow road when they're really on the broad. I'm against those who tell people that the broad road will get them to heaven when it's really taking them straight to hell. I'm against the counterfeit. I'm against Leviathan. Leviathan twist the truth. He doesn't tell you that there is no Jesus. He sells you on another Jesus. He gives you a God of your own making, one that satisfies your own lust, one that allows you to be comfortable in your sin, to say, come as you are, leave as you are. He gives you another gospel. And then he stands on an elevated pulpit and says, love me for it. Because the Bible says that the Antichrist and therefore the spirit of Antichrist loves to set itself up in the house of God wanting to be worshipped. So I would tell you, be very careful, church, that you do not move into idolatry and worship of your minister. We love our ministers. We reverence our ministers. We respect our ministers. We treat them as family. But when you move into worship and idolatry, you are dealing with Leviathan. Pastors stand for the truth, even if the people hate you for it. It would be better to stand with God on the day of judgment and the few that found the narrow way, even though the many hated you in this life, than to stand with the many in hell and be mourned by the few that made it into heaven. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few are they that find it. Make sure that you're among the few. Jesus gave us these words in the very same passage that he said, you will know the tree by its fruit, not by its gifts, not by its presence, not by its performance, not by its charisma, by its fruits. A holy root will produce holy fruit. And the only thing the devil cannot counterfeit is a holy life. Look at the fruit. Do they bear the love of Christ? Do you bear the love of Christ? We got to search our hearts. The Bible says that if we will judge ourselves, then we won't have to be judged by God on the day of judgment. In other words, if we'll take the word of God and read it and judge ourselves accordingly to it and repent and turn away from the things that it tells us to, then we won't have to be judged by him. We'll just walk up to him on the day of judgment and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. 
But if we don't, if we don't pick up that book and decide to come into alignment and agreement with what it says, then on the day of judgment, he will open it up and he will say, you had it right here. He will say, there's no excuse. I gave it to you. The words are here. Now the words will judge you. The Bible says the spirit of Antichrist is rebellious. He is lawless. He works to bring control out of confusion. He sets himself up to be worshipped. He wants attention. He wants vainglory. He doesn't want the people to find the fire of God for themselves. He would rather fluff their flesh than tell them what they need to hear to get the power of God in their own life because then they might walk out from underneath his power. It's very much a pharmaceutical spirit if you think about it. The true prophet of the Lord is the one going out saying, repent, repent, for judgment is at hand. The prophet of Leviathan is is the one going out telling you you're perfect, don't change, stay the way you are. It doesn't matter what people say. God's about to bring you into a worldwide ministry and he's going to give you all the desires of your heart. But they're not turning your heart away from sin and compromise. They're not putting your face in the word of God so that so that you can come into right standing with God, so that you can walk in the power and authority of God because they don't want you to walk out from under their power and authority. This spirit works through division, divides the body of Christ, that seven-headed serpent working from seven different angles, speaking seven different blasphemies. Because Jesus said that every blasphemy that is done by man shall be forgiven them except to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And there is nothing that blasphemes the Holy Spirit more than when a false spirit moves in false manifestation to control and deceive his people, claiming to be the spirit, bringing shame and reproach upon the name of God and the Holy Spirit. I love what Catherine Kuhlman said, and it's so true and so few see it, but she said it so plainly and so often. She said much of what is being attributed to the Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. It is a shame and a reproach upon the name of a holy God who is perfection. And that's Catherine Kuhlman's words. Those aren't mine, but I agree with them wholeheartedly. This spirit works through dependency, bringing you into a place of dependency. They're not discipling you to learn the word of God, to become like Christ, to then go out and lead others and disciple them. They're bringing you into their clutch. This works in religion and it works in governments. And I'm not just preaching against preachers, though it happens a lot within the church because the spirit of Antichrist always tends to work through the church more than through the world. But it works in governmental structures also. So what you see plaguing the church, you will see plaguing the parliament. You just have to learn how to discern it. He brings division. He brings manipulation. He brings control. He brings it through offense. He brings you into agreement with sin which makes you bound to him because you lose your authority when you lose your right standing with God so we're going to pray against this Lord we pray that the eyes of our understanding be opened God we pray that you do what only you can do Lord and that you bring revelation We humble ourselves before you and we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you suffered and went through and endured in order to bring us these words of truth. That we might believe the words of truth. That we might be set free. That we might receive the spirit of truth and have that rhema word of Lord. That sword of truth that would come out of our mouths and cut down the lies of the enemy and defeat the spirit of Leviathan in the name of Jesus. God, we pray your protection over all of your people. We pray the blood of Jesus. We stand in faith in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing in whom we serve. We put up our shield of faith and trust in his perfect love, that he stands with us, that he goes before us, that he guards around us, that he moves through us. And we speak forth the rhema word of the Lord that says, cease and desist in the mighty name of Jesus. You are called out and you are cast out. We serve a notice in a decree of heaven right now in the name of Jesus that you are bound that you are chained we bind you Leviathan in the name of Jesus we lead you off captive and we cast you out of the territory we cast you out of our city we cast you out of Baton Rouge we cast you out of our lands in the name of Jesus we take authority over the land of our inheritance we possess the land as decreed by the Lord God Almighty we put on the full armor of God and we stay 
stand and we put forth the word of the Lord, the rhema, the sword of the spirit. And we say, get ye behind me, Satan. You are the tail and not the head. You are defeated. We stand in authority and we won't be bound by your lies anymore. We won't be confused by your counterfeits anymore. We won't be used by your minions anymore. In the name of Jesus, we're breaking out. I pray that the blinders be broken off of the minds of the people right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that the curse be broken in the name of Jesus. That complacency be broken in the name of Jesus. I call the people out to stand up and to speak the word of the Lord. I call the people out to open the Bible and let the Holy Spirit teach you so that you can have discernment and not be led away by the twistings and manipulations of this evil spirit who loves to twist scripture to make it say what he wants it to say, to make it say what your flesh wants it to say, but to keep you out of agreement and alignment with what it really says, with what God says. And so he strips your power and your purpose as an ambassador of God, as an, as an ambassador of heaven. How can you speak forth the decrees of heaven and be an ambassador of Christ? If you do not know them, open the word and read it and believe it. Everything in our Christian faith comes by by faith, but you can't have faith unless you hear because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you don't know the word of God, you don't have faith because you don't know what you have to have faith in. The Bible said that if you have faith and are able to perform miracles, but don't have God, you have nothing because your faith was not in God. It was not in his word. It was in a lie. It was in yourself. It might have even been in Leviathan or the dragon that gives him his power. We have to come into agreement with the word of God and have faith faith in him because faith in the greater kingdom will bring the greater works of the kingdom because it will bring the greater authority of that greater kingdom and I speak it forth now with authority that the greater works of God are rising up and they're going to go out from the people who have decided to read and to believe and to do what the word of God says and to not wait for a man who is working through a Leviathan spirit to feed another lie into their ear but they're going to will open the word of God and say, I am what God says I am and I'm going to believe this word. I'm not going to try to interpret it away. I'm just going to believe what it says and I'm going to start to walk in it today. In the name of Jesus, I break the lies of Leviathan now in the name of Jesus. I break the boundaries, the constraints that this spirit sets up to corral the people of God. To bring division. I come against denominational division. Which was not of God from the beginning. In the very beginning. The church began to create denominational divisions. And Paul stood up. And he said no. Was Christ divided? Did any of these people die for you? It's about Christ. There is one head. There is one body. There is one church. There is one belief. There is one baptism. And we are all one in Christ. Do not allow yourselves to be divided. Open the word and believe it. There is but one truth. God, we come against the racial divide that this spirit brings forth because if he can keep the people divided and he keeps them fighting against each other, they'll never turn united and start to fight against him. I come against the lies that plant offense in the heart that steals the power of your people away because the Bible says, how can you say you love God whom you have not seen if you do not love your brother who you have seen? So the enemy brings you into this place of offense so that he can cause you to grieve the Holy Spirit so that when the Holy Spirit no longer can reside in you, then the sword of the Spirit can no longer come out of you and he eliminates the threat against him. He has been disarmed. All principalities were disarmed by Christ at the cross, but he is disarming us by by bringing us into offense, by bringing us into error, by bringing us into confusion, by causing us to worship counterfeits. He is stealing our sword. He is, he is causing us to grieve the Holy Spirit so that we cannot bring forth the sword of the Spirit, the rhema word of God, that sword that cuts him down. 
I dry up the dirty waters that he swims in. In the scriptures, the water represented the word. And it says that we are sanctified by the washing of the water of the word of God. The word is a water that washes us. It sanctifies us as we read it, as we believe it, as we walk in faith in it. It changes who we are. It sanctifies us. It purifies us because Jesus himself was a physical manifestation of this word. It proves the word. Everything that he did and was proves the word. He is the word made flesh. And yes, we are washed clean by his blood. But that is also represented in scripture by the word. Because it says we are washed by the water of the word. But that Leviathan, he swims in dirty waters. He swims in a polluted word. He swims in a twisted truth. He swims in a filthy flood. And and I speak it forth now in the name of Jesus that it be dried up and done away with. The word of God says that God is able to destroy Leviathan, to crush his head and to dry up the waters that he swims in. I pray by the word of God that in the spirit this be done, that it never have to be done as judgment in the physical In the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you cut out his feet from underneath him. Lord, bring forth a pure word. Bring forth a clean river. Bring forth the flowing of your Holy Spirit. If the Spirit of God resides in the river of God, then the Spirit of Leviathan resides in a demonic flu. It is a counterfeit of the river of God, and it will not stand anymore. We identify it. We call it out. And God, I pray for humility because he works through that pride. And right now he is stirring up pride in the hearts that would say, how dare. But I say in the name of Jesus, I'm coming forth with a spirit of humility. I pray for the spirit of truth. God, I pray that you come upon each and every person that they would humble their hearts before you and say, Lord, search my heart. I don't want to be deceived. Lord, show me in the scripture. Show me the truth. I want to serve and glorify you. Lord, I know people are not going to like the message that I bring and they're not going to like me for the message, but I'm not in this for pride or for pomp or for position. I'm not in this with a Leviathan spirit. I am in this with the humble, selfless love of a servant of God that says I would rather tell them the truth and see one soul saved and put on the narrow path. And have all the rest hate me for it. Than to stand on the day of judgment with a multitude of people that love me. But we're all going to hell together. God we humbly ask for your heart. Because your heart is humility. Your heart is selflessness. Your heart is love. Your heart is compassion. Your heart will speak the truth because of love. Because it's selfless enough. To speak the truth even when people don't like us for it. To take the lashes. To be hated like the prophets of old. But to be willing to say it anyway. Repent, repent for judgment is at hand. And every man will stand before God. And give an account for every deed. And every action. And every idle word. And every thought and intent of the heart. And if we are not willing to warn as watchmen on the wall. Then your blood will be on our hands at the day of judgment. But today I say as Paul did. I stand clean of every man's blood. Because I was willing to speak the truth. And the Bible says that people don't want to stir up Leviathan because he gets angry, because he's so prideful, because he's bitter, because he slanders, because he backbites, because he gossips, because he runs rampant and tries to character kill you, because he is powerful, because he works in government, because he works in religion, because he works in the high places, because he has set himself up in the high places because of his pride. No one wants to stir him up, but I am here willing to to take a stand and say the truth of God, to speak forth the rhema word of God, that his lives be cut down today in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray for a people selfless enough to rise up and do the same, to open the word of God, to believe the word of God, and to start to speak that word of God, to seek the Lord, to humble themselves and seek the Lord and repent and come before God and get a rhema word from God and bring forth that truth into the nation that others might be set free who have been deceived God your word says that in the end times there would be a great deception and that almost all the world would wander after this beast 
Almost everyone will be deceived by it. It's not a shameful thing that we have been deceived by it before. Everyone has been deceived by it at some point or another, but we've got to come to a place where we're willing to humble ourselves and recognize that a loving God is warning us is shaking us, is trying to awaken us so that we no longer walk therein. Because Lord, in the book of Isaiah, when the word of the Lord was coming forth about destroying Leviathan with the sword, it was at a time when the Israelites were at war with Assyria and with Babylon. And your word says about Babylon, about that Babylonian system. It says, come out from among her, my people, and be ye separate, lest you be partakers of her plague. In other words, I'm giving you a choice right now to break agreement with the enemy because a judgment is coming. A plague is coming. And if you stand in agreement with this serpent, you're going to be destroyed with it when I come to wipe it out. But I'm giving you an opportunity. I'm giving you a chance to take God's side. I'm drawing in that line in the sand and I'm saying come on my side because the ground is about to open up and all those who don't will be swallowed up judgment is coming on Leviathan and all those who hold on with their pride to the lies they have believed and the deceptions they have swallowed they're gonna be swallowed up with him they're gonna face the judgment but God is saying I'm giving you an ark I'm making a way of escape I'm giving you a chance to come out of alignment and agreement with it and come into alignment and agreement with me so that you might be saved because there are two biblical responses to judgment one enough people repent and get saved and come into alignment with the word of God that they become righteous in right standing with God that God not pour judgment out upon them and enough of them come into alignment that God will save the city he will save the region like he did with Nineveh he gave opportunity and they repented and there was revival and there was, and judgment was stayed. But there's another option. If not enough people repent to justify saving the city, then God will save the righteous out of the city. And that's what we see in Sodom and Gomorrah. The ratio of righteous men and women of God was too low to justify saving the city. So instead he just saved the righteous out of the city. He made a way for them to not be there when judgment came. So if you will choose to come into alignment with God and agreement with his word, you will be protected because wrath is not appointed unto the righteous. But we got to love people enough and be selfless enough to be willing to go out and speak the truth in hopes that they might be saved, that enough might be saved, that judgment might be stayed. Because the word of God is sure and it is true. Sin will be judged. If we keep continuing as servants of God in this complacency so that those operating through a Leviathan spirit can, can keep building their own little kingdoms at the expense of God's, then judgment is going to fall on all. We've got to be willing to speak the truth of God at all costs. The Bible says, have no part in the unfruitful works of unrighteousness, but rather reprove them rebuke them be willing to speak in love we cannot work in arrogance we cannot work in pride or we are working through the very spirit of leviathan but in brokenness in weeping we have to be willing to speak the truth we have to be men and women of tears of travail of prayer of supplication and of selfless devotion to the truth God, we pray for the spirit of truth. We pray for the Holy Spirit. We pray for Rhema. We pray for the sword of the word. God, we pray that you show us. We pray that the eyes of our understanding be opened. God, we pray that it spread like a flood upon the land, but a flood of clean water, of right word, of truth in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Sword of the Spirit, come. Lord God Almighty, have your way and cut down that twisting serpent that has deceived the nations and deliver the hearts and souls of men. Bring, bring truth and holiness back again. God, we worship you because that spirit wants to be worshipped. It wants to draw attention. Let me tell you something. Anything that 
that brings disorder or distraction to a service is not the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit of Leviathan. Anything that draws your attention to it and away from God is not the Holy Spirit. It is that spirit of Leviathan. God, it wants to be worshipped. It wants attention. It wants to draw the eyes and the focus towards it. So today we draw our eyes and our focus towards you. We give you worship. We magnify you. We lift your name on high. We worship Jesus Christ. We worship the God of all things, the creator of all things, of whom everything is under your feet. We worship you and you alone. Come down off your throne. And fight for your own.